Welcome to worship here at Idlewell Community Church uh, online. It's Advent, and it's a season of preparing for Christmas. It's a season where we dive into the Christmas story so that it might have its full impact on us. So today, we're going to hear again the glorious announcement that the angels made to the shepherds on that hillside. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. That proclamation, coming from heaven itself, is that God is for us, not against us. He leans into mercy and grace and and yearning for fellowship with us. And it's our calling, our privilege, to respond to that lean from God and to not allow the unspeakable grace that He offers to be offered in vain. So come with me this Advent to embrace the beauty of this offer of fellowship with the living God, our Savior, even Jesus Christ. Let's worship, shall we? Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow. Let us pray. Dear Lord our God, we come to you with gratitude and praise. Thank you for answers to our prayers. We are grateful for our thrift shop volunteers and for the blessings this ministry brings to our community and missionaries around the world. 
We thank you for the workers you are providing and pray you will continue to bring them. We pray for those overseeing and serving at the thrift shop. We lift up our life group ministry and praise you for the participants. We pray you would grow this ministry. A brother-in-law with diabetes is doing better. His legs are not collapsing anymore and his brain fog has cleared. We praise you. Lord, we praise you for your son and for his birth, sacrifice, and resurrection. We praise you for sending him to us so our relationship with you could be restored. We lift up these prayers before you. A number of congregants have contracted COVID. We pray for mild symptoms, quick, complete recoveries, and no long-term issues. A grandson with a sunken chest is scheduled to have surgery next week to remove metal supports. We pray for a successful operation, a swift, complete recovery, and for good health in the years to come. The son of former members has been diagnosed with stage 4 cirrhosis of the liver. We pray for healing and wholeness. A congregant is struggling with osteoarthritis. We pray for you to slow the progression of this disease and provide healing and wholeness. Several members are fighting cancer. We pray for the cancers to be eradicated. We pray for you as the great physician to bring healing and restoration. We lift up the countries of Ukraine and Israel. We pray for the hostilities between Russia and Ukraine and between Israel and Hamas to end as soon as possible, for hostages to be returned safely and for a lasting peace to be negotiated. We lift up the local arts school. We pray for more students, faculty, and staff to draw near to you, to know you, and love you more deeply. We thank you for the families and members that attend our church and pray for additional families and new members to join our congregation. We lift up our couples and singles and pray for you to draw each person near to you and near to one another. We lift up this nation and its leaders. We pray for you to raise up leaders who have the wisdom, desire, faith, and courage to guide this nation according to your will, returning us to living by the principles upon which this country was founded with you at the center. We pray for revival to spread across our country and the world. We pray for friends and family who do not yet know your Son to be drawn near and nearer to you, claiming Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we may love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind. May we continue to trust in you. We pause now for silent prayer. And we close this time of prayer by praying as Jesus taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm looking around the church or in the sanctuary and I'm seeing Christmas trees everywhere. Wreaths line the walls. We've got nativity displays uh, sprinkled all throughout the church. And it gives evidence of the fact that we are now in the Advent season. Uh, Throughout the centuries, the church has designated Uh, the four Sundays before Christmas as the Advent season, with the word Advent meaning coming or arrival. And so for these weeks, pretty much the entire month of December, we always take a fresh look at Jesus coming, his arrival uh, in our world. And our focus on this Advent will be looking at Jesus as the protagonist of Christmas. Now, 
protagonist is not a word that we use commonly unless you're in an English class, and then it's used quite a bit. A protagonist, it's a literary term. It just simply means that the main character of a story, a drama, a, a novel, a, a narrative, a book. A protagonist is the lead person who's driving the action, and the plot revolves around that protagonist. They're the emotional heart of a story, a drama, a narrative, a movie. Protagonists, they are the ones who influence the outcome. So Jesus is clearly the protagonist of Christmas because the entire story revolves around here. There's a lot of uh, supporting cast, but they're all looking at Jesus, including prophets who would foretell his arrival centuries before he came. And then the shepherds and the wise men and, and Mary and Joseph, they're all looking at the protagonist. That's because the Bible gloriously declares that God himself has stepped into the story. The creator has become the enfleshed protagonist. So history is, in fact, now his story. He's the one who takes the lead role. He's the one who's driving redemptive drama. He, he is the main plot. He's the emotional heart of humanity's story. But here's where the plot thickens a little bit. There are at least three different kinds of protagonists. There's a hero protagonist, an anti-hero protagonist, and a villain protagonist. The protagonist that we all root for, the protagonist that, that we all like, is the hero protagonist. Because they've got noble virtues and qualities, and they're always driving the story toward good. They're the ones wearing the white hat. Uh, the protagonist that frustrates us the most is the anti-hero protagonist. Because there is a significant mixture of good and bad, of great qualities and ignoble qualities in this person. They're actually ill-equipped to drive the story toward a, a good end. King Saul in the Old Testament would be a perfect illustration of the anti-hero protagonist. The protagonist that we dislike the most is the villain protagonist. They're driving the narrative uh, in a bad direction, evil direction. They're the ones wearing the black hats. So if Jesus is the protagonist of Christmas, the question is what kind of a protagonist is he? A hero protagonist, an anti-hero protagonist, or a villain protagonist. Well, he's not the anti-hero protagonist because he has no bad qualities that are mixed with the good. He wasn't constantly switching hats in the narrative from white to black to white to black. Nor is he the villain protagonist. His nature is simply incapable of being a villain protagonist, of promoting chaos and destruction of hurt and evil. So that only leaves the hero protagonist and before you get too excited about Jesus being the hero protagonist of Christmas, you need to ask the question, what's the attitude and the action of a hero protagonist toward those in the story who violate, say, truth and justice, who at times just flaunt the rule of law, people whose actions really hurt other people? What's the protagonist's response to that? Well, the protagonist who champions truth and justice, they're not required to be the friend or the advocate or the savior of those who violate the rule of law. It's an uncomfortable truth, but that describes all of us, that we've all violated God's law, no exceptions. There's an elaborate Old Testament sacrificial system that tried to deal with that reality in the Old Testament era, that we all stand guilty before God. We are all transgressors. Paul in the New Testament talks about this in Romans 3.23 when he said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if we're truly honest with ourselves and with God, we know that's that to be true. That there are things that we've said or done that have hurt other people, even those whom we love. And sometimes in a very significant way. We all stand guilty of violating God's intentions for us. So, Jesus had every right to come into this world to be our accuser. 
And he could still retain the designation of being a hero protagonist if he's the main character who's simply telling the truth about our moral standing in the light of a perfect holy God. But if you let the message of Christmas sink in, if it really penetrates into your soul and becomes more than just a familiar Christmas verbiage, then it's clear that the agenda of God's protagonist coming into this world, it wasn't to accuse us of falling short or not measuring up. The announcement that the angels could have given that first Christmas night to the shepherds was, you're afraid, well, you've got good reason to be afraid, you sinner, because the sobering news that I'm bringing to you right now is that there's been born in the city of David one who will point out the entire truth about the depth and the extent of your sins and their consequences. It's what the angel could have said. But the beautifully familiar words of the angelic announcement is the exact opposite. The angel says to these shepherds, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's a stunning announcement. The shepherds saying, or the, the shepherds hear from the angels, don't be afraid. I've got good news, not dreadful, sobering news. The news that I'm bringing to you, it's meant to produce great joy. Because there has been born for you, not against you, a Savior, not an accuser. This is the consistent message of Christmas. And this is the reason why why Jesus came into our world. Months before the shepherds got the good news uh, announcement on the hillside, there was an angel that came to Joseph and told him, you know, your fiance, she will bear a child and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Our names have meanings to them. And the meaning of the name Jesus is God saves. So Jesus' very name reflects the reason why this protagonist came from heaven to earth. Not to point the bony finger of condemnation like he could have. Not to accuse us of our sins which outnumber the sand on the seashore. No, the, the action of this protagonist is driving toward redemption and salvation. There's an old gospel hymn that points this out when it says, He did not come to judge the world. He did not come to blame. He did not only come to seek. It was to save He came. And when we call Him Savior, then we call Him by His name. That last line is a beautiful truth. That When we call Him Savior, we're actually calling Him by His name because the name Jesus means God saves. This salvation emphasis, it isn't just the, the center of the Christmas story, but of the entire redemptive drama as it unfolds. The most well-known verse in all of Scripture is John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Well, go on to the very next verse, and it says this, for God, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. So Jesus, the protagonist, is on a mission of, of rescue, not accusation. Jesus, near the end of His mini earthly ministry, He gives a one-sentence explanation of why He came to earth. He said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, the Apostle John records in his gospel some of the most tender words that Jesus ever uttered. And they were spoken in the center of howling winds of harsh condemnation 
when Pharisees and scribes, the religious leaders, they roughly threw a woman at the feet of Jesus and said, here's an adulteress caught in the very act. Our law commands us to condemn her. What do you say? And we just see their veins bulging and the spittle flying from their self-righteous lips. And at first, Jesus doesn't say anything. Just stoops down and begins to write in the dirt. They're not going to let this go, though. They demand an answer. Again, they say, what are you going to say to this? And the reason this whole thing is happening is because Jesus has a reputation for extending grace even to the worst of sinners, but surely not this sinner, not what she's been caught doing. But scripture says, when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and he said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, these religious leaders, they were all self-righteous. But none of them would go so far as to say they were absolutely perfect in the sight of God. And so, one by one, they all just kind of slinked away. Till the only ones left are Jesus and the woman. And the scripture continues when saying, straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. Now, if you want to know a little secret about this particular narrative in John's gospel, you'll find that even followers of Jesus had difficulty with the extent to which Jesus was offering salvation. The story of this woman taken in adultery, it appears in only one of the nine earliest manuscripts, the copies that we have of the New Testament. Six of the other manuscripts just omit it altogether. Two of them even leave a big blank space where the story should be. Augustine, uh, in, who lived in the 400s, uh, he was a church leader and he thought that it wasn't indeed a, an original uh, writing of John, but it was omitted in these other places to avoid a scandal. Because anything that could be interpreted as being soft on adultery, that needs to be suppressed. So for centuries, many in the church thought that this story of forgiveness it is simply too dangerous to be believed. And some thought it needs to be eliminated. God came to save even her? Let, let me give you one other place in the Bible where some Christians have had difficulty with the extent to which Jesus lived up to his name that God saves. One of the most beloved members of our church is a a guy named Rick, just a fantastic individual who is quick to remind us of his favorite Bible verse, Romans 8.1, which says, Therefore, there now is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, if you grew up with the King James, you'll find that that verse is actually different. Something is actually added to that verse. The King James version of that verse is, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. This last phrase is just added. Well, somewhere down through the centuries, as the Bible got copied and recopied and recopied, some thought that the shortest version of this, this verse is just simply too dangerous to be believed, too radical, too easy to be misunderstood. It had to be qualified. So they took a phrase that appears three verses later and they just took it and put it here to qualify it, to make sure that we know that you have to walk according to the Spirit in order for there to be no condemnation. But in fact, God wants our hearts to be convinced of this truth that therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus period. Drop the mic. Your sins and mine, they, they should result in our condemnation. 
Eternal justice would be served if that were the case. But there's this outrageous good news that the angels spoke to the shepherds about, that there has been born for us a Savior who is Christ the Lord. We have been saved from condemnation because someone else was condemned in our place, and that would be Christ the Lord. He alone is our Savior. He alone can even qualify to be our Savior. See, God would do violence to any sense of divine justice if He were to simply ignore the consequences of our sins that we've committed. Justice would be violated if, if He just arbitrarily dismissed the penalty, saying, oh, it really wasn't that important. Sin's not that big of a deal. Well, God has to be the one doing the saving because He's been the one that we've sinned against. So in order for Jesus to save us, He has to be fully divine. He has to be God. God is the one who forgives. He's the one who saves. But in order to have any validity in stepping forward to save human beings, to bear the sins of humanity, Jesus also has to be fully human. Only one of us can take our place in judgment and condemnation. And that's exactly what Jesus did. A human being who lives a perfect, sinless life, who is also fully divine. I only know one person in the entire history of humanity who fills that bill, and it is Jesus. God saves. So there is now, therefore, no condemnation for us because Jesus was condemned. He bore the punishment that we deserved, and He's completely satisfied the demands of eternal justice. So in this verse, of the Apostle Paul, that there's now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. It's so radical, some Christians felt they needed to qualify it. But the fact is that in so doing, they've already overlooked the fact that there is a qualifier in that verse already. The Bible doesn't say there is now no condemnation, period. It says there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you are not in Christ Jesus, then there's coming a day when your sins will catch up to you and you'll have to experience the eternal consequences of those sins. If Paul, who penned these words, was not in Christ, then one day in the future, justice would cry out on the day of judgment, saying, Paul, there were scores, if not hundreds of innocent people beautiful people whose only crime was confessing Jesus as their Lord and you, Paul, you mercilessly threw them into prisons where they rotted and where some of them died. It's not time to pay for that. If he's not in Christ Jesus, that's what he would hear. But in fact, Paul was in Christ and as such, Jesus stepped into Paul's place and suffered the penalty that Paul deserved. And so in this Advent season, there's no more pressing issue than this. Are you in Christ, in Christ Jesus? If you are, then there's now no condemnation awaiting you. That Jesus came into the world not to condemn you, but to save you. And the angels' words, they're meant for you. In the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This all-important phrase, in Christ, it so captured Paul that he, he pens it 143 times in, in his letters, in his epistles. And that phrase is referring to anyone who by faith has been joined, who has been united to Christ. They, they fully embrace Jesus' willingness to bear their punishment in their place, and they embrace the fact that Jesus died for them and who was raised on their behalf so that they'll experience new life and the forgiveness that God offers in this new life. And there's a consistent willingness then in the person's life to want to live a, a life that reflects those realities. So if you have any question whatsoever as to whether you are or are not in Christ, Humbly pray to receive this unimaginable gift 
of new life where there's no condemnation awaiting you. And it's all because of Jesus, the protagonist of Christmas, who gave his life that you might be saved. Let's pray to this Christ, shall we? Lord, we see from your word uh, the absolute uh, indispensable need to be in you, to be united to you. And that's why you came into our world with a heart that, that our hearts might be joined to yours. And so we pray this Christmas season to fully embrace you, Jesus, and, and the forgiveness that you so freely offer as you took our place on the cross to bear our sins. If we would but say, Jesus, be my Savior, be my Lord. This is our prayer that would fulfill the words of the angels and the heart of Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray, even Jesus, the one who saves. Amen.